If you got a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter six. We are continuing a series in the book of Romans. Uh, we're gonna kind of turn, switch gears a little bit as we enter into chapter six. Paul's going to introduce a new theme in the book of Romans. If you're new to the conversation, let me kind of catch you up, okay? Uh, up to this point in the book of Romans, Paul has been trying to get across two main ideas, okay? Uh, Paul is one of the most ardent followers of Jesus. If you're not familiar with his story, God radically rescued and saved him. Jesus revealed himself to Paul while he was on the road to go and murder and torture and enslave and imprison Christians. Uh, and Paul became such an ardent follower of Jesus. He planted most of the New Testament churches that we read letters to in the epistles. Uh, he wrote a third of the New Testament, 13 letters. God used him in a powerful, mighty way. And he's writing a letter to the church that was birthed in Rome. He didn't plant that church. It's believed that there were people who came to faith in Christ in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost who lived in Rome and they went back and they planted a church all by their lonesome through the power of the Spirit. And so Paul is writing them a letter to kind of give them a full picture view of the good news of the gospel. And up to this point in the letter, the first five chapters, two things Paul's trying to get across. The first big idea that Paul is trying to communicate is this idea of condemnation. Every human that shows up on the planet Earth stands condemned because we are not holy. God is holy and God's holiness demands perfection. And Paul goes to great lengths in two and a half chapters, chapter one, verse 18, all the way to chapter three, verse 21. And he leaves no stone unturned, pointing out that everyone stands condemned before God, the religious and the irreligious, the moral and the immoral, the church folk and the pagans. We all stand condemned. We need a mediator, somebody to step in the gap and to bridge the gulf between our sin and God's holiness and righteousness. Now, good news, Paul doesn't leave us in this condemnation. He moves us in chapter four to the idea of our justification. Say justification. It's a fancy Christian word that simply means that we have been declared right with God. It's a legal term. It's forensic in nature. And we understand what it means to be right with a person or an institution. Anybody ever owe a debt here? You don't have to raise your hand. The debt collectors, they, they, are, they are just relentless, right? To be in right standing means that no person, no institution has anything against you, no claim against you because you owe them nothing. We stand righteous, declared as justified before God because Jesus Christ has successfully obeyed all of God's demands, perfectly kept the standard of God's holiness and righteousness, and then offers that to us by grace through faith. So that when God looks at us, he looks at us not on the basis of our good works, but on the basis of where we stand in relation to Calvary and to Jesus's cross. Justification is the Christian proclamation that for those of us who have confessed Christ, we and God, we're okay. We're okay. I could put my head on the pillow at night knowing that I stand righteous in Christ, even when I blow it, because God looks at me on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus. Now, that's never a license to sin, as we're going to see as we get into this passage today, because Paul doesn't just teach us about justification, chapter four and chapter five. There's more to this good news. In chapter six, seven, and eight, Paul's gonna switch gears and begin to talk about our sanctification. Say sanctification. Another fancy Christian word that simply speaks to the process of us growing up in our faith. How many of y'all are parents in here? How many of y'all got kids and you've had to do your hard work of helping them grow up and become contributing adults? It's been bumpy, hasn't it? Yeah, but parenting is the perfect analogy for discipleship. We are all kids in Christ, learning to grow up, learning to live out what is true about us now in Christ. And so Paul's going to switch gears in chapter 6, 7, and 8 and begin to speak to this process of how we grow up in Christ. Don't worry, we're not going to hang long in Romans chapter 7. Everybody dies in chapter 7. we got to get through to chapter 8. That's where the victory is in the spirit 
of Christ and join to the spirit of Jesus. Uh, we're just going to get through the first six or seven verses of Romans 6 this morning. And he, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to attempt to do. I want to answer two big questions that, frankly, I have wrestled with most of my adult Christian life. And I think you have too. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm all alone here. First question is this. What is our relationship to sin? Especially as a Christian, a redeemed, born again, filled with the spirit. What is our relationship to sin? I'm a new creation. I love Jesus. I've been saved and rescued from sin, death, and the grave. Yet I still struggle with sin. Why? Uh, Maybe you have asked that question before. I believe Romans 6 is going to speak to some of that. The second question is, what exactly happened 2,000 plus years ago on the cross of Calvary. We know that Jesus died on the cross, uh, but what happened? Did he die for our sins? When I first got saved, I was told that Jesus put on a backpack and all of my sins were in it. And he died on the cross and I got my sins forgiven. It's true, but there's more that happened at the cross of Calvary. And so we're going to try to unpack a little bit about what actually happened at the cross of Calvary. And Romans 6 is uniquely situated to teach us that truth. Now we titled this next part of the sermon series. We did a bit of a brand refresh uh, and we're just, we're simply calling this part of the series, Jesus for us, in us, and through us. An exposition of Romans 6, 7, and 8. You ready to do this thing? All right. Romans chapter 6, if you got a Bible. Romans chapter 6. Paul begins this chapter with a question. And it was a question that he knew would be asked on the heels of what he just got finished saying at the end of chapter 5. If you were here last week, do you remember what Paul said at the end of chapter 5? It was scandalous, y'all. Here's what Paul said at the end of chapter 5 of Romans. You cannot out sin the grace of God. Don't care how wicked you might be, if you are in Christ, you can't out sin the grace of God. God's grace abounds more. Listen to it. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. This is what Paul writes. Now... The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And God's people said, amen. Why did God's grace abound all the more? So that as sin reigned, say reigned. What tense is that? Past, present, or future? Past tense. Okay, so he's talking about something that sin used to do for those of us who are in Christ. As sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, tucked into this good news is a bit of an explanation as to the nature of sin. And it's going to kind of help us get at that first question that I want to answer this morning. Dustin did a really great job last week kind of talking about what the nature of sin really is. And we come by it honestly. We often think of sin as the fruit of our actions, of our behaviors. But we don't often think about sin starting first and foremost as a root problem. That ultimately leads to a fruit problem. Sin doesn't start with our hands, it starts with our heart. And there's a unique word that Paul introduces us to here, uh, introduces us to here in Romans chapter 5, verse 21. That's going to kind of help us answer this question. What is our relationship to sin? The word is reigned. Reigned. Well, what comes to mind when you think of this idea of reigning? We're not talking about precipitation. We're talking about kings, right? Queens, kingdoms. More specifically, we're talking about subjection and mastery and slavery. Because that's what Paul is getting at here. When he talks about sin used to reign, he's talking about sin used to rule, used to have mastery over us. Sin was king. Sin was master. Sin was the boss. I think it's 51 or 52 times the word sin is used in Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And only one time is this word sin used 
as a verb. You know what a verb is? It's an action word. A behavior, a practice. One time in 50 some usages in Romans 5 through 8 is sin used as a verb. The rest of the times, it's used as a noun. Sin is personified. And we see this early on in Genesis chapter 4. I don't have this verse. You can mark this down. But in Genesis chapter 4, 6, 7, and 8, Cain and Abel is the story. Cain is angry. His brother Abel has offered to God an offering that was much more acceptable in the eyes of God. And Cain is angry. And his bitterness is starting to create the seedbed for murder in his heart. And God comes to Cain and says, hey, be careful. Your countenance has fallen. And sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. I don't know if you've ever thought about sin having desires. But God, through Moses, in the very beginning of the Bible, points out sin as having desires and longings. And we know that sin seeks to kill, steal, and destroy, much like the enemy of our souls. Sin's desire is for us. Again, Dustin talked about this last week. He said that when we show up on this planet Earth, we are dead in our sins and trespasses, and that at the core of our disposition is a nature that is inherently sinful, that is bent towards independence and rebellion. Nobody had to teach our kids to do bad. They came by that naturally. But God wants to reveal something to us in Romans chapter 6 and reveal to us what our relationship to sin really is before Christ and, more importantly, after we become Christians. And so Paul says sin used to reign. It used to rule. And we used to obey its desires and its whims. We were slaves to sin. Much of the scriptures communicate this truth. Paul even gave us a list of heinous practices back in chapter 1, pointing out how we used to love to sin. And let's be honest, apart from Christ, we did love our sin. We loved it. We enjoyed it. We planned for it. We tried to out-sin our friends, but sin used to reign. Now grace reigns for those of us who are in Christ. So, So what is our relationship to sin? Well, it depends on what tense you are referring to, past, present, or future. So as far as I can tell from my study of God's word, we have a fourfold relationship to sin. One, two, three, four. Let me explain. We can't help but think of salvation in relation to sin. I mean, it is sin, right, that made salvation necessary. It is our sin that has alienated us from God and reduced us to his enemies. But when we look at scripture, I see that we sustain a fourfold relationship to sin. First, we are all under the penalty of sin. Say penalty. We already pointed out that Paul opens this letter speaking about our condemnation. We have all transgressed God's law and rebelled against him, and thereby we are guilty, deserving of his punishment. And what is the punishment? Romans 6, 23, Paul's going to say a little bit later. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Why? Because God is holy, righteous, unimpeachably perfect. And he cannot entertain the presence of sin. And because he is holy, it is good, right, and just for him to respond violently to sin. We are all under the penalty of sin. Ephesians 2 says that we were by nature children of wrath. God's settled displeasure was on us because we were sinners by nature. First relationship to sin, we are all under the penalty of sin. Second one is another P. You're welcome for the alliteration. Sin exercised power over us. We're all under the power of sin. Say power. And we already saw that at the end of Romans chapter 5. Sin reigned. Sin was master. Sin was ruler. Sin controlled us. We obeyed its dictates and its whims. We were under the power of sin. So not only are we under the penalty of sin, but we are also subject to the enslaving and ensnaring power of sin. And then there's a third and a fourth relationship to sin. These are very close together. There is the presence of sin. Say presence. Presence. 
and the pull of sin. Say pull. I think we would all agree, even those of us who are Christians, we have experienced the pull of sin, tempting us, drawing us to try to get our needs met apart from Jesus, to try to take things in our own hands to accomplish things. The presence and the pull of sin. Now, why are these distinctions important? Because of what Paul is about to say next in Romans chapter six, verse one, read with me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Again, stay, stay, stay with the, uh, the argument, the flow of the argument. Paul says in Romans 5, 20 and 21, you can't out sin the grace of God. Grace abounds no matter how much we sin. Chapter six, verse one, he knows the objection of his hearers. Well, does that mean then, Paul, if you are teaching this radical free grace, then that means we can do whatever we want because our sin means God's grace is gonna keep abounding more and more and more. And what's Paul's response to that conclusion? Verse two, he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul's objection to this conclusion, this faulty conclusion is rich. He says, may it never be. Why? Because it does not make sense to Paul that a Christian could still live in and abide in sin because they have died to sin. Grace, do you know that if you are in Christ, you are dead to sin? I know it doesn't feel like it, and I know you don't act like it. You may not even think like it. But God's word is declaring that for those of us who are in Christ, we are dead to sin. Let me read verse 1 and 2 again slowly. Just listen to these words. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it. Paul says we have died to sin. What exactly does he mean? Well, let me tell you what he does not mean first. Two things. Being sin, dead to sin does not mean that we are now incapable of sinning. If that meant that we could never sin again, Paul would not instruct us just a little bit later in this chapter to no longer present the members of our body to sin to obey its desires. We are still very much alive to the presence and the pull of sin. But now in Christ, indwelt by the spirit of God, we have options. We can say, no, no, I'm dead to that now. So being dead to sin does not mean we are incapable of sinning. We are still very much capable of sinning, even though we are still Christians. But it also doesn't mean that we have just kind of pulled up our big boy pants or our big girl pants and finally and forever renounced sin. That at some point we just declared to God, you know what, God, I'm done sinning. I promise you, God, I'm never going to do that again. You ever, you ever try that before? Make that proclamation? How'd it, how'd it go for you? That was that season where you rededicated your life 42 times and you came down to the altar every weekend, right? If we could just fully and forever renounce sin, then our severing from sin would somehow be tied to our ability our hard work, our determination. But as we're gonna see in the text, our justification and our sanctification, both of those are gracious gifts from God. We have work to do, but our work primarily is believing God and learning to orient our life around the truth of what he says about us in Christ. So being dead to sin doesn't mean that we're now incapable of sinning or that we finally and forever renounced sin. So what does he mean when he says we are dead to sin? And, and listen to me, I said this last service. Some passages in the Bible, we just get to get up here and preach. Some passages we need to teach. This is a teaching passage. So stay with me here. What does it mean to be dead to sin based on the context of what Paul is saying here? Well, we gotta go back to our four Ps. And based on the context of this passage, what Paul is saying is that we are dead to the penalty of sin and we are dead to the power of sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross 
satisfying the demands of God's holiness and righteousness, and thereby the penalty of sin that we owed, the debt that we owed to God was forever and fully paid for in Christ. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and he's declaring that the penalty of our sin has forever been rendered obsolete. That's the good news of the gospel. If you are a Christian, you will never, ever stand condemned before God because of your sin. Jesus Christ died for your sin. And we are also dead to the power of sin. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, and we'll find out in just a moment, we died with him, the power of sin was rendered obsolete as well. It was broken. We serve the bondage breaker who breaks the chains of sin in our lives. But because we don't know that or don't believe that or do not set up practices in our life to help us not continue in sin, we tend to not believe the truth. It's almost as if we were in prison and God opened up the bars and said, the power of sin is broken, you are free to go. But we don't move. We stay put. We are dead to the penalty of sin. We are dead to the power of sin. Now, we are still very much alive to the presence of sin and the pull of sin. We will see that later on in Romans 6, very much so in Romans chapter 7. And, and I have to make this aside. Dustin texted me the other day and said, hey, man, make sure that you tell him about the totem pole illustration. Um, he spelled totem wrong. I just needed to make sure that you guys understood that. It's T-O-T-E-M, not T-O-D-U-M. Jeez. I don't often get, he sings better than I do. And so I'm a little salty about that. Uh, a mentor of mine uh, turned me on to a mentor of his who says it like this. Anybody ever get a splinter before in their toe, in their finger, in their hand? Yeah? Does that make you a totem pole? <laughs> or is there simply wood dwelling in your flesh? Here's the distinction. When we show up on this planet Earth, we are dead in sins and trespasses, and at the core of our nature is sin. We have what the Bible calls a sinful nature. Okay? It is a bend towards independence and rebellion. But as we're about to see in Romans chapter 6, that sinful nature was put to death on the cross and we were raised to new life and joined to the divine nature. Second Peter chapter 1, we received God's life. So we no longer have a sinful nature at our core if we are in Christ. However, sin now dwells in our members. I don't know what that means. Does that mean that sin is now lodged in our flesh memory banks and that when we are tempted, we usually go down those ruts of habit patterns of thinking and feeling the way we used to get our needs met when Jesus wasn't a part of our story? Is that what sin is in our flesh, constantly offering these temptations? I don't know. We're gonna try to unpack that as we walk through Romans chapter seven. But sin dwelling in our members is much different than sin being the core disposition of our lives. Are you following? We're not sinners because we make sinful choices. We're sinners because we have a nature that is independent of God and inherently sinful. But in Christ, we get a new life. That's why we say we're not sinners saved by grace. We are saints who sometimes sin. That's semantics to some. To me, that is an identity claim rooted in the truth of God's word. We are dead to the penalty and the power of sin. We are still alive to the presence and the pull of sin, but we are not defenseless in Christ, for he is greater, right? Beloved, he who lives in us is greater than he who lives in the world. We have options now in Christ when the indwelling sin 
tries to get us to go back under the mastery and power of sin by enticing us or lying to us or bringing to mind or memory something that we used to dabble in before Jesus Christ. That is how sin works. That is how the enemy works. It lies to us. Satan is the father of lies. Listen, not every thought is a spirit-sponsored thought and you could be driving down the road listening to Joy FM and automatically a thought pops into your head that does not come from Jesus. Those are the fiery darts of the enemy. And in those moments, we have a choice. Are we going to choose to marry our will to those thoughts? Or are we going to take those thoughts captive and turn them over to the obedience of Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. But it takes work. So what's, the, what's our relationship to sin? We're dead to the penalty and power of sin. Still alive to the presence and pull of sin. And until Jesus comes and delivers us from the presence and pull of sin, giving us these new glorified bodies, we will be at war. And it is a war between flesh and spirit. And we need to learn to be led by the spirit. Galatians 5. Grace, this is why we aren't to continue in sin. Paul says in Romans 6 verse 2, we don't live there anymore. Look at how he talks about it. Verse two, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What does it mean to live in sin? He almost makes it sound like sin is a place, an abode, a, a, a realm of operation and activity. And it is, it is. Paul says elsewhere in Colossians 1 verse 13, he says, he, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. We used to dwell in a land of darkness, a domain of darkness where Satan was king and where sin held sway over us, but no longer in Christ, we are in a new home. We've changed zip codes, folks. We've relocated to the land of grace. Again, Paul is not saying that Christians won't ever commit individual acts of sin anymore. He's also not saying that Christians aren't going to struggle with habitual sins. What he is saying is that Christians will not be able to go on abiding and remaining in the company of sin. It used to be our home. The air we breathed, we swam in it. It was the major tenor of our lives, but no longer. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? In other words, Paul is saying that we will not be able to, in Christ, be able to continue in sin deliberately without distaste or diminishment. Which means that if we're still living in sin, making it the normal and customary practice of our lives, then we have to ask, has the gospel truly penetrated our hearts? Has the gospel of Jesus Christ truly brought about change in our lives? We are dead to the penalty and to the power of sin. Now, how did this happen? How did we get dead to sin? Chapter 6, verse 3 through 7 is how. And this is going to help us answer the next question. What exactly happened 2,000 plus years ago at the cross of Calvary? Now, follow the train of thought. End of chapter 5. God's grace is bigger than our sin. Well, does that mean we can do whatever we want, Paul, and call it grace? No, of course not. Because you're a Christian and you've died to sin. You don't live in it anymore. Okay, Paul, well, how did that happen? Romans 6, verse 3, read with me. Do you not know, Paul writes. Don't you know, Grace? This isn't the only time he says this. He says this four times in the next 10 to 12 verses in some way, shape, or form. He says, do you not know? He says, knowing this. He says, don't we know? Now, here's the point. Paul is saying this is bedrock, foundational, need-to-know Christian truth. Grace, don't you know that all of us, verse 3, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Be honest. How many of y'all heard the word baptized and you thought of water? He's not talking water. He's not talking about what we do on this stage once a quarter where we dunk people in a horse trough underneath the water. What we celebrate is believer's baptism. Actually, what we do with a horse trough of water is a living picture demonstrating exactly what God has done for us in and through the work of Christ that Paul is gonna unpack right here in Romans 6. The word baptized in the Greek language is the word baptizo. Say baptizo. And it literally means to immerse. Immerse. 
It means to plunge. It means to so identify with the thing that that thing becomes your thing. If I had all of my ducks in a row, this dented bucket would be full of red paint. But I waited until 11 o'clock last night to think of this sermon illustration. So this is an empty bucket and you're just gonna have to deal with it, okay? Imagine with me that this is full of red paint and I have a white hand towel. Now, what do you think would happen if I immersed, if I plunged, if I baptized this white towel into a bucket of red paint? Would it come out white? Why not? Yeah, because what happens in the bucket happens to the rag. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul wants us to know that when we were immersed, when we were plunged, when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. So that when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. Look at verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him. We were buried. Past tense? Present tense? Future tense? Past tense. He's talking about something that has already happened in the lives of believers, of Christians, of Christ followers. We were buried, therefore, with him, with Jesus, by baptism, by immersion, by being plunged into death, in order that. Here's why we were baptized into Jesus' death and burial. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul is teaching that when Christ died, we died. When Christ was buried, we were buried. And when Christ was raised to walk in a brand new life, we were raised to walk in a brand new life. And the only way that I can attempt to explain how this happened is to climb on a chair. We're good. (laughs) Pastor Dustin came up last service, so there he is. Look, I have great balance. Actually, I don't have great balance. Um, you know, on the Wii Fit, they age you based on your balance. I'm like 87. Okay, so this is the only way. This is the only way I really know how to understand Romans chapter 6, okay? And this isn't the only way to understand doctrine proper about God, okay? Uh, but the way I understand God is he is eternal, okay? You, you get that? God has no beginning. He is uncreated which means that God can see infinitely into the past that way and infinitely into the future that way. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is never finding out about something in your life the same time you are. You tracking with me? But I also believe that God lives outside of time and space. Some people believe that heaven is space and time bound. I don't believe that. I believe that God is up here outside of time and space in his heavenly helicopter, right? Looking down on time in space. You tracking with me? What's happening behind me? Look, man, don't mess up my point. God's up here, outside of time, outside of space, seeing all of time as present tense. If God sees all of the past and God sees all of the future, to God, everything is right now. Which means that, thank you, brother. Give him a hand, y'all. He didn't do anything. Which means that if this is my timeline, okay, we understand how time works, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. If this is when I was born, November 4th, 1983, that's my birthday, so you can send me gift cards later. And this is where I confessed faith in Christ, circa 2002, 2003, my senior year of high school. And and somewhere on the timeline, I'm going to die. Hopefully way down that way, right? God sees all of those points on my line of time, And he sees them as right now. You know what else God sees on the timeline of history as right now? God sees the cross. And as as far as I can understand this passage, something spiritually and supernatural happens that when I confess faith in Christ somewhere on this timeline, God takes me spiritually and he immerses, he plunges, he baptizes me into Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm not asking your thinker to validate this. This is a spiritual truth that the spirit of God needs to reveal to us. 
First Corinthians speaks that we have all been baptized into one baptism by the Spirit into the family of God. That is a spiritual reality that God has accomplished. When we confess faith, when we repent of our sins, God takes us and he baptizes us. He immerses, he plunges us into Jesus Christ on the cross. Which means that when Jesus died, it wasn't just our sins, plural, that he took to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, noun, to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus became our sinful nature. He took our sinful nature into himself as well as our sins on his shoulders. You tracking? Jesus became the very thing that God had to put to death so that when Jesus died, we would die with him and we would die to the penalty and the power of sin. And when Jesus was raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6 verse 4, guess what? We were raised with him. And we don't have like a newly improved old life, right? Like God wasn't interested in rehabilitating your old Adam life. He couldn't help you. He had to put you to death. And he did. He crucified us in. This is why Paul can say in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in him. Why? Because Paul understood his old life, his old self, his sinful, selfish, helpless, hopeless, hell-bound self was put to death on the cross. Don't believe me? Look at verse 5. Paul keeps going here in verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he died to sin, we died to sin. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Was Jesus raised from the dead? Was he resurrected? And so were we. Some teachers are going to try to push this off into the future. Uh -uh, no, this is a real time right now. Past tense truth. Verse 6. Here's the linchpin. We... No, here it is again. Paul's saying, do you know this? Grace, don't you know? We know that our old self was crucified, past tense, with him in order that our body of sin might be put to death, might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died, verse 7, has been set free from sin. Grace, we don't have a sin problem anymore. We've got a source problem. But if I was the enemy, I'd get you focused on all your sins. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang with those who do. Let me deal with your hands, but never talk about your heart. Let me deal with the fruit, but never address the root. Our old self, our Adam life was put to death on the cross with Jesus and we are raised to walk in new life, his life. Then Cameron, why do I still struggle with sin? Because we're still alive to the presence and pull of sin. And for some of us, we have had a lot of years in the far country, meeting our needs apart from Jesus Christ and establishing some deeply ingrained ruts. Am I right? But in Christ, we now have options we did not have before. In Christ, now I can choose to walk in the spirit rather than walk in the flesh. And the good news of the gospel is even if I choose the flesh in a moment of weakness, I am not condemned. And if your conclusion is, well, then I can do whatever I want and call that grace, You've not understood the gospel. Nobody who understands the gospel ever wants to sin against a God who loves us so much that he wiped out every one of our enemies. Satan has been defamed. We have been, sin has been rendered obsolete and powerless over us.
the law has been fully and forever kept by Jesus Christ who created the law and now fulfills it in and through us. Romans 8, 4, the, the law is being fulfilled as we abide and walk in the spirit. And so here's your homework. Because I, listen, this, this, this is some heady stuff. But this is, this is ground floor truth. Don't you know, Grace, that if you have been baptized, if you have been immersed and plunged into Christ Jesus, you are dead to sin. Stop submitting yourself back to the whims and dictates of sin. You are free from sin. I know you don't feel like it. I know you don't act like it. That's a discipleship problem. That's where we need to invite brothers and sisters in Christ to help hold us accountable and hold us to the truth of what's true about us now that we are in Christ. But to the degree that we know that we are dead to that. Here's your homework. And you will be tempted to sin. I don't know. Soon. (laughs) Here's your confession. You ready? Here's your confession. You ready? I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. I am dead to that. Satan, thanks for the offer. Sin, not buying. I'm not interested. I don't live there anymore. I've changed zip codes. That's not my home. I've got a brand new wardrobe. I've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I'm dead to that. And the more we learn to confess that truth, I'm telling you guys, we will find the power of the spirit of God to walk in victory. I've had seasons in my life where I experience victory over all manners of sin. And there are seasons in my life where I forget this truth. And I run back to my vomit like my sin like a dog returns to his vomit. Philippians 3. Horrible picture. Biblical though. I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. Look, call the church next time you get tempted and you say I'm dead to that. And you choose victory. We want to celebrate with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder that we're dead to sin. We're still wrestling with the presence and pull of sin, but oh God, greater is he that is in us. Help us to believe this truth, God. It doesn't line up with our experience, but God, it can. So Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us, remind us, convince us of the truthfulness of your truth and help us as the people of God encourage one another and to remind one another of this truth. Good truth. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.